Go? Okay. All right. Hey, everybody. All right. So my name is Sonny, and uh, this is my friend, Ted Wright. Uh, him and I have been friends for uh, 15 or 18 years. He's lying. Yeah, something like that. So Ted um, had a meeting here in Atlanta and uh, was cool enough to call and say he wanted to stay at my house. Of course, he can stay at my house anytime he wants. So uh, Ted is a, a professional archaeologist, and um, he said he'd be okay with me asking some questions. But the first thing is I wanted to let him introduce himself. Go ahead. Thank you, Sonny, for having me here <laughs> in my kitchen. In your kitchen, yeah, uh, it is an excellent kitchen, by the way, and great food served here in the kitchen. Um, but yeah, my name is Ted Wright, and I am the uh, founder of EpicArchaeology.org, um, former uh, executive director and teaching director for CrossExamine.org. I've also um, uh, worked for Southern Evangelical Seminary as a professor, also New Life Theological Seminary in Charlotte, which is now Christ uh, Charlotte Christian uh, Seminary, Charlotte Christian School and Seminary, and um, uh, taught seminary for about 13 years or so, and I've, I've spoken on apologetics and archaeology for probably a little over, you know, 10 or 15 years uh, around the country, and I've done some stuff in Europe as well. Okay, all right, cool. I um, also wanted to say that um, I used to hold a group in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina called the Mars Hill Discussion Group of the three-year run that I had. Uh, Ted was the largest group uh, that, that showed up, and uh, that was pretty cool because that group uh, was mainly catering to uh, people who are, are inviting those who were either not Christians or were skeptical, skeptical about Christianity or the existence of God or anything, and so it was very interesting to me in the context of more philosophical discussions that Ted uh, being more into archaeology that that wound up being the, the biggest group that ever showed up uh, uh, in the in the whole history of Mars Hill so that was pretty cool alright so what I'm gonna do I want to be relatively quick because um, I'm curious about what uh, Ted's gonna say I'm just gonna hit some topics and you can say whatever you want okay. about it what sure. knowledge or experiences you've had okay um, so uh, so the first topic I want to hit on is uh, Noah's Ark uh, what's going on with that as far as discovering archaeological uh, discoveries for Noah's Ark what's happening sure it's a great question Sonny uh, this is uh, one of the top 10 questions I get asked whenever I go speak is uh, inevitably a question about Noah's Ark comes up um, let me just say um, just to kind of paraphrase this I mean um, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of speculation over the years as to where exactly Noah's Ark is. Um, you know, people, some people say it's on the the Ararat Range. Some people say it's on the Ararat. There's been a lot of debate among evangelicals as exactly where Noah's Ark is. Um, I'll just tell you my personal experience okay. um, with this artifact, um, if it does in fact exist. Um, several years ago, I was invited to go to a meeting. Um, in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, which is where you and I used to live, and it was a closed-door meeting at the time, and uh, there were several well-known archaeologists in Charlotte and, and around, you know, seminary professors, Gordon Conwell, R RTS, Reformed Seminary, and SES, which is where I was teaching at the time, and uh, we got to see footage of a particular structure on Mount Ararat, and we were told that this structure this wooden structure on Mount Ararat was located at approximately 13,000 feet elevation. Um, now, I, I'm actually a climber, and I've been on Mount Rainier in Seattle, Washington. It's about 14,000 to the summit. And when it was, uh, when it finally kind of broke in the American press, and especially around evangelical circles, um, it was broken as, you know, it was a fake, it was a forgery, it was a hoax. Um, mainly by several people, uh, American evangelicals, who sort of dismissed it as uh, being uh, not true. Um, but uh, some of the footage that I have seen of this structure and some of the people that I have talked to personally and my experience with it is that, um, you know, in archaeology, of course, we, one of the very first things we do is site survey. So if someone finds a site that is of interest, we want to go check it out. So at minimum, at minimum, you know, even if you don't believe it's true, at least go check it out to see, you know, is there something there? And um, so I was invited several years ago to go to this particular site on Mount Ararat. My schedule would not allow me to go at the time, but I have since talked to several people that have actually been at the site. And so, um, so right now, my, my understanding is that there is a wooden structure on Mount Ararat and is not in the Ahura Gorge. It's actually in a different section of the mountain than where, where many ARC, ARC researchers have been, and it's found at 13,000 feet. So let, me, so let me just say this. Now, 
I'm not going to be dogmatic about, yeah, it's Noah's Ark, but it's a wooden structure. Um, it contains animal droppings that are fossilized. Uh, there are. How do we know that? There have been some. We found there's been discovered that 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 is actually they actually they've recovered. Them? Yes, they have recovered these these animals. And I don't, I'm not sure if they have been analyzed yet. But my understanding is that they were going to be analyzed chemically, you know, geologically to see where they came from. And then also some pottery has been found as well. Now, my personal view. This is just a personal. And again, it's way too early. I mean, when you're when you're when you have something that's a survey, you can't say dogmatically exactly what it is, but. But just from what I know of the ancient Near East, when you, when you have holy or very rare sites, you would go to these sites and you would leave a votive offering. So you would leave a piece of pottery. So the pottery may not date the site. So if we, so the pottery that's been found at the site may not date that site, date the structure to that particular time of the pottery. This, the, and it could, it could be, but it also could be that the pottery is from a latter period in which the people who... Uh, and, you know, went up to this site to leave a, a, because I've been there, kind of thing. So, so right now, um, my knowledge is that there's some still research that's being done, uh, some some research dollars, and people uh, are kind of in the works to go up there and research the site. But it's at thirteen thousand feet. I've been on top of Mount Rainier at fourteen thousand feet, and let me just say, you can barely breathe on top of Mount Rainier at fourteen thousand. Well, not it's not the breathing is hard, but it, also just doing any kind of physical activity. So. Personally, just my initial, it would be very difficult to make, to fake this kind of thing. If this is genuine, this, this artifact up there that's buried okay. in the ice in the glacier, uh, it's a wooden structure. Um, okay, so it's been rooms. verified as wood. Absolutely. Okay, yes. so, so um, I've, I think some people were arguing that it, um, it, would, it possibly would be uh, almost, uh, given the conditions uh, that they're that they're seeing in, in where this thing exists, that there's no trees, there's no wood in that area. Right. Oh, no, no, absolutely. It'd be a miracle for it, someone to, to even to even get well, a boat up there to yeah. fake something like well, this. Well, no trees, correct? yeah, no trees exist above the Alpine zone. The Alpine zone is about 10,000 feet, so it's three at least 3,000 feet above the Alpine zone. So, um, you know, um, as an archaeologist, one of the things that I would say is that... Um, it certainly fits that it could be Noah's Ark. Um, not going to be dogmatic about it because I still don't. I just don't know. We don't know. Well, but but it certainly that's that's my latest. You asked me the question okay, about right. the Ark, and so so that's my the latest understanding of my own personal experience with this. Okay. And uh, I would just say that anybody who's skeptical of it, I understand the skepticism. Sure. I would be the same thing. But uh, from what I have seen. I personally am very interested in this site, and I would love to go up and do you know further research there. Okay, all right. Yeah. So, um, so as you know, I, I um, had the fortune of studying some under James Tabor at UNC Charlotte, who sure. is a well-known, respected biblical archaeologist. Yeah. Um, any thoughts on uh, his perspective of this? He's heard about it, and does he think it might be, or what do you say? Uh, well, I was actually present with Dr. Tabor, with Professor Tabor at the, the meeting. He was actually there, and he, from what I remember, he said that he thought that the, the footage was legitimate and was genuinely interested to see and learn more about the site, but he didn't dismiss it as being not legitimate. Okay, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one last thing about this. So I remember, even back in the 70s, there was always some kind of a movie, always some kind of a documentary yeah. in search of Noah's Ark. I think the big one was in search of Noah's Ark. It even came out in the yeah. movies. You had to go to the movie yes. theater in the 70s yes. to go see this in search of Noah's Ark. <laughs> so uh, I can hear people just saying, oh, you know, gosh, here we go. Here we go again. Yeah. It's the same old thing. Boy, okay. cry so, so why, what, what is it, so what, what in your mind is making this different or special? Because after all, I mean, you can look from the 70s to the the 80s to the 90s and era, you just look there's mm -hmm. always some documentary oh we found something in Mount Ararat so what's the big deal I mean what is there something special about this um I mean I I, I don't know I mean I, I I don't I don't want to say you know all I know is that it is a wooden structure at 13,000 feet they've been in it it's, and they've been in it yeah I've seen I've actually talked to the people one of the first people who to, to actually go in and film it besides the Turkish people people from Turkey who have found the structure uh, was a Chinese a gentleman by the name of uh, Panda. Panda Lee was his name. And I actually met Panda, and I met some of his team members and uh, who have actually been on the structure. And there are no nail marks, no nail markings. It's, uh, it's made out of wood. It it's, uh, looks like mm -hmm. there's a black pitch substance on the inside, inner walls of this the building or this, uh, this type of structure. Again, you know, I'm not going to be dogmatic about okay. it, but, but it's... Uh, 
certainly worth going and investigating for okay. sure. Absolutely. All right. So the next subject is um, Shroud of Turan. Um, what do you say? Uh, what's the question? What, do I think it's real? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, so yes. you know that looks like one of those things. Oh, okay, some some uh, relic gathering uh, yes. entity, maybe the Catholic Church, whatever, is sure. grabbing up sure. these things and they're waving them around. Yeah. And so, what what are you saying? Do you think it's real? Do you think it's not? Yes. What's up? Okay. Uh, um, let me just before I answer the question, let me just say this about archaeology in general. So, so archaeology is not it's not like it's not like. Um, well, any science really is inductive. So you're, you 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 gather your evidence and you build a case for you know theory hypothesis. You build a case for what something might be true. So th you know that's true of anything. So there's a there's a high degree of probability in any theory, historically, archaeologically, scientifically, even science theories have okay. got they have a lot of evidence behind them. So you know you know from a, from a logic standpoint, you know you can say well. Do we absolutely know? Well, no, we don't absolutely know, but we have a very high degree of probability. So you're asking me a question, do I think that the shroud is genuine? My, my understanding is, from what I understand of it, if, if my understanding is correct of some of these things that have been discovered lately about the shroud, I personally think it may be genuine. And it's hard to unpack this in a few minutes, so I understand. Totally, yeah, right absolutely. That. But I'll just say this. Uh, there was an article just recently published in the National Review that actually matched the uh, Sudarium of Oviedo, which is in Spain, which is a cloth. Um, the blood type is a rare AB blood type over the Shroud of Turin. And so that's two separate? Two separate events separated, yeah. And two from, different items? And two so different items. Is so the cloth is, uh, is basically like a face cloth. It's a, it felt like a is that in the Bible square. called the napkin? Yeah, the napkin, okay, the right. facial napkin. So, and then the, the shroud itself is just a, a singular piece of cloth that's sewn together on one end of the other okay. that was wrapped around the body. So, so one of the things, and um, one of the best books on the subject, if anybody's out there interested in reading about more of the scientific aspects of the shroud, um, I was uh, honored to be on CNN a couple of years. Well, honored, probably like honored to be on CNN, but uh, I was I was on CNN. We'll keep our political perspective exactly, there, exactly. somewhere else, right? Now. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I was so, trying to get on Fox News, but yeah, CNN. I'll take what I can get. No, but we we were. I was there. I was. I was gonna. I was supposed to talk about the shroud. And that was what they were going to interview me about. Was the shroud. So I did some research and um, I, uh, uh, I did a couple of emails. And I think I called Gary Habermas, and and I, I've known Dr. Habermas from a couple of other things. And he was very kind enough to because um, he's done a lot of work on this and a lot of research on the shroud. And so I actually called him and I said, "Hey, hey Dr. Habermas, I'm going to be." On history or on CNN, and I need to know, you know, what are some good research uh, things. So he told me about this book. It's called uh, "The Crucifixion of Jesus" by Frederick Zugby, Z-U-G-B-I-E, mm -hmm. Frederick Zugby. And um, so that book provides a lot of scientific analysis. He's a forensic pathologist, and basically can discover like what led to somebody's death. And so the image in the shroud, what what they've done is they they rule out what it's not. And, and just to, just because you said we don't have a lot of time here, I'll just tell you a couple sure. of things real quick. Okay. Um, one is it's not a painting. That is absolutely a scientific fact because they've done an analysis of the shroud, and it is not a painting. So they've looked for pigments. They've looked for um, uh, bonding polymers, any kind of thing that would mm -hmm. um, would indicate pigment or anything like that. There is none. In fact, the shroud, the image in the shroud is so thin that it can be scraped off with a razor blade. And it's actually, when you look under electron microscope to the actual cloth itself, um, it is um, actually on one thread of a th uh, one one fiber of a thread, which you can't even see. So you, there's not a paintbrush oh, small enough. Okay, I, yeah, it's very that's, that's interesting. So, very, yeah. So my understanding too, and I, and if, if there's not time to, to explain this, I understand. But um, so in, in my uh, understanding, there's also this. Uh, maneuver uh, when they're looking at the cloth where they do some kind of a radiological exam of it so it kind of inverts everything so you can see the image yeah. it kind of dis dis this makes the image disappear and the shadow appear so that you can yes. see actually more of a person and not right. the, the other so can Correct. you comment on that yes yeah, so um, so so the only the only way that kind of image and, and it looks like a three-dimensional image and so it was a it looked like a real human body which which actually I'll, I'll comment on in just a second, but let me say a couple other things, um, two other things about this, because there's, there's actually a whole lot on the shroud, but let me just get back to that sure. question in a second. Um, the other thing that was discovered was, was the sequence of the imaging on the shroud. So the sequence, what I mean is, okay, so, so 
so this is what was discovered as well. That the that the image in the shroud, the 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 the, the wounds in the body was was dead first, and then or the blood was on there first. The blood was on the shroud. The stains were first, and then the image came second. Okay, are you saying that's discernibly knowable? Yes, that's a scientific fact. Okay, the, that the stains, the blood stains on the shroud, were made first. Okay, so that means that. The body was laying and wrapped in this cloth when it was bleeding. It wasn't cleaned. And we know from the Gospels that Jesus' body had to be buried rapidly because it was Passover. It was getting dark. And on the third day, on the Sunday, the women came to the tomb to bring the burial, you know, to wrap mm-hmm. and embalm the body. But there was the body no body because it was wrapped hastily. So the blood stains were there first, and then the image was made on the shroud. So the image is literally a three-dimensional picture, and there, there's, uh, I mean, we know of two kinds of radiation, and we don't know this about the shroud, but we know scientifically there's two kinds of radiation that can cause that image in the shroud, what would cause an image like that. X-rays, like from an X-ray machine, that was an incredibly immense amount of power uh-huh. of, of ultraviolet radiation. And the other type of, of uh, radiation is called gamma radiation. And gamma radiation is the most powerful form of radiation in the known universe, so so when you look at, if anybody knows like science, and you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, okay. light. So light, light. is on a spectrum, and there's laser light. So in the very, very high frequency spectrum, okay. the very highest frequency of light is ultra, it's, it's gamma radiation. Then it goes to X-ray gamma radiation. Okay. So, so what that means is that, that there's some type of extremely high radiation emanating from a body that's been dead. All right, so I was I was wrong. I think I I uh, I thought that there was a kind of a test that they did that was radiological, and I was wrong. It's the uh, s- seem seemingly maybe the uh, it was a resurrection. Well, the, the, it's, it's a the, the thing. Here's the thing that that, that scientists are baffled. I, Something. How about that? It's unexplainable. Shall but it's say. there. It's there. Science, but, okay. science can't explain current current science. Let me just say it this way: current science cannot explain on that cloth how that image got on that cloth. That is. But it, but they know it's there, but they just don't know what's. The, they what's don't the deal. know. Okay. They don't know how it was formed. Okay, that's correct. All right. So moving on real quick. So have you done any recent digs? Uh, the most recent dig was in 2014. I was with in, in uh, Kerbet El Makader, which is in the West Bank in Israel, about nine miles north of Jerusalem, and we believe that that is the biblical city of Ai uh, that was uh, talked about, you know, recorded in, in uh, Joshua chapters uh, seven and eight. Mm-hmm. And um, we excavated the, the, our team, uh, Associates for Biblical Research, who I'm actually with. Um, I'm one of their associates. Um, we have excavated there. The, our team has Dr. Bryant Wood and Dr. Scott Stripling and our t- dig team. They've been there for about 15 years or so, a little over. And um, all the evidence from that site um, really, really points to it very strongly. Such, such as? Such as in 2013, the Christianity Today named their number one archaeological discovery was actually our scarab at Kerbet el Makader. And the scarab was dated from the uh, 18th dynasty of Egypt. And it was from the... Um, it was actually from either. Okay, let me just back up and say this. This this little scarab is like a little small. Um, it's like it looks like a like a beetle on one side. Uh-huh. Okay, and on the other side there is a uh, an inscription on it. Okay. So on this inscription, um, it is actually a uh, looks like a little uh, uh, sphinx figure. Okay. And uh, so in Israel, I think we have actually had an expert in those particular objects. And based on the, our Israeli expert, we believe that that object is from the reign of Tutmosis III or Amenhotep II, and which would independently date our site to the time of the conquest, which we think happened in about 1401 to 1406 BC. So, based on the early date of the Exodus, and, then, and though there's a debate among evangelical scholars as to when the Exodus occurred, I happen to believe, uh, as, as well as our team at, at ABR, that the date of the Exodus was at 1446 B.C. So at the, at the Exodus of 1446, the Israelites are in Egypt, or in, in the wilderness, for 40 years, and that would place the, the conquest at about 1401 to 1406 B.C., depending on. So Jericho was first, and then Ai. And so this city of Ai was discovered. So we found... There were many things that were found that really confirmed this. Number one, that was burned. The city was burned in that in that there was time. evidence frame. of that? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I had a piece in of, the dig. Yes, I okay. had a piece of pottery actually from that. And whenever I go to speak, I actually allow people to hold a piece of pottery in their hand. They can actually see it that the pottery's burned from that layer, from that time frame. 
And it's pretty cool to, piece, to hold a piece of biblical history in your hand sure. to know that that was from, from what you can read, a story in the Bible. And then also uh, the geography of the area fits the Bible exactly. Well, that's what I was going to say. So the what's geography. the value of that? It seems to cooperate with the, uh, totally. with the biblical text. Totally, yeah. So, so the biblical, the Bible is very clear. It says that, um, uh, so if you know the story of I in the Old Testament, uh, Joshua, well, when they were told, they were commanded, the Israelites were commanded not to take anything from Jericho, not to take any of these sacred objects. They were to offer it to God as a burnt offering. Now, why would they do that? Why would they? Why would they offer like a city as a burnt offering? God, well, God commanded them to do this. Why would He do that? Yeah. And, well, you have to understand what was a burnt offering. What was it for? And in the book of Leviticus, we learn about the burnt offering. It was a first fruits offering, and it would have been an agricultural thing. And, and, and it, the idea is basically: so let's say you have a garden in your backyard, and you have a tomato plant. Okay, and you're you spent all this time and all this effort, you know, uh, tending your garden, tending, tending your tomato plant, and the very first beautiful ripe tomato that comes off the vine, instead of taking it in your house and eating it, you burn it and give it to God. Well, why'd you do that? Because you're recognizing that God is the one who gave the the vine. He gave the tomato plant. He gave the water. He gave the soil. It's a recognition that God mm-hmm. is the one who gave it. So by God commanding the Israelites to give Jericho. To him as a burnt offering, it was a recognition of faith. So when they uh, when they did this, they were commanded not don't take anything from the city. The city was destroyed exactly as the Bible says it was. There's a burn layer. We can talk about that's a whole other subject, mm-hmm. Jericho. But we found that John Garstang in the 1930s, uh, an archaeologist with the University of Chicago, excavated there. Anyway, he found the burn layer, and then later uh, some later work uh, showed that that was indeed the case. But what my point is is that. Um, we we know that the second city that they were trying to destroy was I, which they should have destroyed. Uh, but there was a guy named Achan who actually stole some things from Jericho. Was told not to, so they didn't get victory. So they tried to destroy I the first time, they didn't. And then they they finally dealt with the Achan issue, and uh, they achieved victory. Now, how they achieved victory at I was that it was a classic ambush. So the city of I, the gate of I, the Canaanite city fortress. The gate pointed north, and there was a hill to the north. When you read the biblical account, it says that Joshua and the armies of Israel drew the king of Ai out of the front gate. Well, he had his secondary force behind the city. Mm-hmm. And so when the, when the king of Ai opened up the gate of the city and the army went out, the armies of Joshua, the, the second army, was split and was behind in the valley. They came up out of the valley and went into the city and destroyed it and burned it. So we've been there, we've excavated, so, we found the burn layer, we found the destruction, we found the, the, all of the, the, the gate pointing north. Um, it says the king of Ai was actually buried uh, there. Okay. All right, so, so the point then is that it just seems to uh, verify and corroborate uh, everything yes. from the scripture. Okay. Yes. Um, I, my, I think my sound engineer is about to get ahead. Okay. <laughs> Bye! <laughs> That's what it's like doing an interview in your kitchen right there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> kitchen interview. Okay, we'll try to zoom things along. I'll have to reach over and turn things off. Eventually, I have to be short because I don't know how much memory we got here. Okay. But, um, okay, so um, real quick, um, um, and I, this is definitely one. You, you might say, hey, let's just pass on that one, Sonny, because okay. it's, it's too much. But um, any recent um, controversies, um, we were talking about Rosetta Stone earlier um, and um, – some you know, some res- recent discoveries in um, well I don't I don't even know what to call it, it, uh, it you know, yeah yeah talking about the, Old Testament studies uh, Old Testament well, linguistics Hebrew yeah yeah so you were earlier you were telling me about some some things that were going on I'm going to be very honest with you it was way over my but all this is <laughs> way over my head anyway but can, you want is is it even possible to give the the summary on that or is that just sure easy? yeah. I'll try it. And, and for, for anybody who doesn't know, you can just they can look it up, but just sure. Want, okay. sure. So I'll I'll just preface it by saying this and you're what you're asking about, is there any new like um, any new groundbreaking discoveries yes. in archaeology, yes, yes, that linguistics? Would be. <laughs> yeah. Yes, there is. And As it relates to archaeology. Yes, I would say so. And um, so again, you gotta be caught again, everything always caution because you wanna be you don't want to be dogmatic, and I'm not being dogmatic here. I'm just saying that uh, um, if if our colleague is correct about this theory, our colleague is a, a friend, Douglas, a Dr. Douglas Petrovich, and he's also a senior researcher with Associates of Biblical Research. He's also a professor and a gentleman and a scholar, great guy. Uh, Doug Petrovich uh, did his Ph.D. at the University of Toronto. So he just recently published 
um, a book uh, that you can get uh, from Carta in Jerusalem. It's like it's a very expensive book. It's like 80 bucks for the book. And uh, his theory, Dr. Petrovich's theory, is that Hebrew, the, the Hebrew language, is the first consonantal alphabet. What is that? First mean? consonantal alphabet. So, so scholars, um, linguistic scholars in the ancient Near East are divided. There's a big debate as to whether what, what the first consonantal alphabet is. The way I understand it, and again, this is not my area of expertise. This is just me, you know, speaking right. from, you know, generally speaking, um, is that that they know it's a Semitic language, Semitic. So they know it's Semitic, but they don't know which language it is. But they know that consonant. So, so ancient languages didn't have consonants, but they knew there was a language that began to use consonantal language. So, um, so Dr. Petrovich, in his book, theorizes that that Hebrew is the first consonantal language, and if he's right, and he's also he, now he set out. He didn't set out to discover um, any kind of like other names or anything like that. Okay. But based on his research on this language. He has discovered in the process the name of Moses, the name of Manasseh, the name of several other Old Testament characters. Okay, when you say discover, you mean like... In the language. Archeolo- in, archaeologically? Archaeologically in these Sinai. So, so he has discovered, like he objectively found these things. Well, yeah. Well, some of them were some of them were in museums. Some of them were, um, it, were at, at maybe still in the Sinai. Uh, some of them were, I think, in the Petrie Museum. And I think the Petrie Museum is in London, in England. Okay. Uh, yeah. This is from uh, Sir, Sir William Matthews Flinders Petrie. He was, a, was one of the founding fathers of biblical archaeology, Flinders Petrie. Okay. He's the first guy to use, like, pottery to date sites. Okay. And so, anyway, so Petrovich, if he's right about these Sinai inscriptions, um, about uh, these pictographs, that sort of are a connection between Hebrew and Egyptian, then this will that be... That he found. That he found. Well, he didn't personally find them. But okay, well, he gathered he's, and studied. Right, he studied them, and he's translating these, and he's done his PhD dissertation work on these. So if he is correct, and I, again, I trust his judgment, and again, time will tell. What, what's his back? I don't mean to interrupt. His background, his, I mean, does he have... Hieroglyphics. Have, Okay, so is he a respected authority, or is he just some guy who showed up? He or? just well, he did. He's done original research on this, and he just he just got a, he graduated his PhD from from uh, from uh, Toronto University of Toronto. Okay. Um, but um, so if he's correct, then this will this will overthrow about 150 years of uh, liberal Old Testament higher criticism that basically says that there is no historical evidence for the Exodus or conquest or any kind of historical validity of the Old Testament. Now, there's a big debate today, or at least I don't know if it's still even called a debate, among, among biblical scholars and among ancient Near Eastern scholars called the ma- maximalism-minimalism debate. And sometimes some people call themselves biblical maximalists, some people call themselves biblical minimalists. So a biblical minimalist would be someone who uh, follows, like, uh, there's, a group, there's a group of scholars called the Copenhagen School of Biblical Interpretation, and they follow these uh, Danish scholars. And so basically mm-hmm. they say that the Old Testament is a complete myth there is no such thing as ancient Israel. It's all made is this coming from German German higher criticism? Yeah, well, no, yes and no. Indirectly, it really stems from Heideggerianism, from Heidegger, Mar, uh, Martin Heidegger, oh. uh, from from postmodernism, postmodern philosophy, and and uh, Michel Foucault, Jacques Lacan, a lot of French postmodernist Greek, Greek constructionists. But they were influenced by Martin Heidegger. So philosophy infects archaeology. So those would be the medieval minimalists. But the maximalists themselves are not really maximal in the sense of what we would call a maximalist. So the maximalist today, one well-known one is uh, Dr. William Deaver at the University of Arizona, which I think he's now retired. And uh, Dr. Deaver calls himself a maximalist, but um, he doesn't believe, though, that Israel really has any kind of uh, identity archaeologically uh, before the the monarchy, before, before David and Solomon. So anything like Exodus, Conquest... You know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that's all sort of, yeah, we don't really, there's not any evidence of that at all. And so, so he's a maximalist, so, uh, so this figures into that. So, 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 so if Petrovich is right, and there are a lot of people who would, it would undercut, because a lot, most, let's just face it, most ancient Near Eastern scholars today completely discount the Old Testament. I mean, even and it's based on a philosophical presupposition. Yeah, their their views they would they would say it's based. No, on They're archaeology. not going to say that. I mean, but no, I no, no. It, they would say okay. it's based on archaeology, but their archaeology is then in turn affected by their philosophical views, whether they know it or not. Exactly. Yeah. So, well, not that, but then also their view of the text itself. So they, right. they view the biblical text with suspicion. They automatically accuse it of being wrong without even giving it a, a chance. Yeah. And so, 
So let me just say this. For anybody out there who believes that the biblical text is genuinely historically reliable, there is now good scholarly evidence. And now you can believe it by faith, and I do, and many people do okay. believe the Bible by faith. But now there's good archaeological historical evidence that what, what, what we read about in the Old Testament is well, true. This is uh, Don't lose your train of thought on, on mm -hmm. what I was asking about. Okay. But this is interesting because I think, especially my experience with dealing with those in, say, philosophy or the philosophy department, most people um, think that things having to do with the Bible and such I would say even Christians, they divide things up into uh, the difference between fact and faith. And even well-meaning Christians will categorize uh, the Bible and even the history of the Bible. Well, you just take it on faith. You just believe it on faith. Well, in a sense, maybe that's true. We understand right. what you mean. But at the same time, is it also true that these things are can be verifiably so, uh, even by, say, by archaeology, which I think is what you're, you're getting at, and that, that archaeology can verify that this is this is not just something we believe, it's actually the case. These things happen historically. Yeah, but again, um, so this kind of gets into a crossover to another question. And yeah, the I, question of I want to be realist, but... No, 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 it's, very, it's a very good question. Seems, it's, seems the question is the question of apologetics, and we don't want to put... We don't want to put too much emphasis necessarily on archaeology, although, I mean, I, I, I agree that archaeology is a huge part of our apologetic defense about Christianity, but it's, it's, it's a piece, a very crucial piece of a larger puzzle, of a larger case okay. for Christianity. Right. So, but yes, the general answer to your question is yes, I think that archaeology can function in that way. In fact, I teach, I, I've, I've taught Old Testament for 13 years, and our archaeology too. One of the things that I teach me personally, I can't answer for anybody else, but me personally, I think archaeology has three functions. Archaeology can clarify, it can illuminate, and it can and it can affirm. And what I mean when I say affirm, I don't mean it can prove, you know, Christianity's true or it can prove Jesus rose from the dead, but it can affirm that the biblical text is reliable historically. It's just it's just a, it's just at minimum. Here's why: because people who don't trust the Bible were very quick to point out when they think the Bible doesn't. Oh, here's an example. So if it if there's if there's a if the if archaeology can function as a way of disproving the Bible, then conversely it can also act as a way of affirming the text. Okay. And I think it can. In fact, it's very clear it can, because you can read the Old Testament and you can see the evidence of yeah. In fact, a lot many archaeological discoveries, Sonny, have been discovered accidentally. There were not people looking out there looking to prove the Bible. Like Dead Sea Scrolls? Dead sea, well, not necessarily that, but like, like in, in, when they found, in 1991, I think it was, they found the Pontius Pilate inscription. They were not looking for Pilate's name, but these archaeologists were digging in Caesarea, and they were actually excavating an a amphitheater in Caesarea on the sea, on the seacoast there in Israel. They found the name of Pontius Pilate. They were out looking for him, but they found him. And so there are many examples of archaeology, of people finding people's places, names, cities, things like that. Those are not people out sitting trying to prove the Bible. So, but there's an example of how archaeology affirms what the biblical text says. And one other example, there's many examples, but one other example is a very famous example.